Show podcast. I'm Karen Hoyer. And I'm James Donlan. Hi, Karen. Hello. Season four. For What's Pardon that? me? What? What? Mm-hmm. what? Uh, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. Um, season you. four. Yes. It's starting off very smoothly, as I can see. <laughs> and um, let me introduce the guy that I always introduce most of the time the guy in the darkness behind us, Michael Diaz, who is our producer. He's the one that makes this all happen, and we are indebted to him to the end of the world. So, Michael, thank you, wherever you may be. Thank you, Michael. Yes. Today's guest is David Gaines. Yes. David Gaines is a founding member of the Moving Picture Mind Show, a London-based movement theater company that toured Europe and the world for 10 years to great acclaim. David studied and later taught mind, mask, and movement at the Ecole Jacques Lecoq in Paris, France. He is the first and only American invited by Mr. Lecoq to teach at the world-renowned school. He has taught at the Graduate School of the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and now teaches at George Mason University. He also works as a professional clown at Children's Medical Center in Washington, D.C. As a teacher, his particular areas of expertise are the Lecoq pedagogy, pedagogy Pedagogy, 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 excuse me, mask work for performers. <laughs> Here we go. I don't know. I've been sick. Mm-hmm. Everybody. Uh, there you go. Hydrate. There. Okay. I don't know. Maybe we want to do this again. Mime and clarity of movement for actors, presentation, and storytelling. In addition to his own performance work, he is a writer, director who has developed and directed shows for theater companies in England, Paris, and Salzburg. He currently tours his two most recent solo performance pieces, The Circus Theme, A Little Business at the Big Top, and the Samurai Epic, Seven Times One Samurai, which has won awards and sold out at theater festivals all across the country and the continent. And with that, let us welcome in David Gaines. Hello, David. Oh, hi. Hi. <laughs> hi. Glad you caught me. I was just looking elsewhere. I'm sorry. Did, did I miss the intro? Oh, no. It's all right. <laughs> You're in Virginia. Is that correct? I am in Virginia. Yes. That's right. Yeah. I'm in a small bunker expecting a nuclear attack soon. So uh, I'm actually. But, yeah. mm, you, have, you have a piano with you, so you'll keep yourself entertained, right? Good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm in Fairfax, Virginia. One of the practice rooms of George Mason University. And um, yeah. David, we're so glad you're here. And uh, I know you because I also work for Healthy Humor as a clown doctor, just like you do in Washington, D.C. And uh, so we've met each other and taken workshops with each other. And I've also seen you perform a little business at the Big Top here in Chicago at the Physical Festival which I thought was just a couple of years ago, but it was actually 2015. So it's been a while. (laughs) And I've uh, only seen David perform once in Santa Barbara, California, but he can't even remember if the moving picture mime show performed there. So we hope it was him, but I'm pretty sure it was. Okay. Probably one of those knockoff companies because it was. Yeah. But the moving picture mime show was a very well-known, very, uh, accomplished group that you were a founding member of. And um, I'm, you know, I'm wondering, uh, you know, it's almost like being in a famous band, like at some point bands disband. So, and that period in your time must have been very rich and very, uh, very exciting during that, those, those 10 years, correct? 
It was great. It was great. I, I have no right to, uh, you know, expect an experience as delightful as that. It was, so it was basically being part of a touring circus, three guys driving around in a transit van doing work that we love to share around all the little towns of England and then towns in Europe. And then when the British Council picked us up to tour the world, we got to go to Malaysia and, you know, all over the place. It was it was great. Wow. And, then, and your partners were, were both your partners British. Um, they were. Yeah. yeah. And, and what were their names? Their names were one of them was Toby Sedgwick. Mm -hmm. who has gone on to, uh, I think he was knighted, actually. He did the movement for uh, War Horse and, uh, oh, yeah. and has done work for films, et cetera. He's, he's had a great career. And Paul Filipiak, who uh, went on to pursue his Buddhist uh, practice, is now named James Eastwood. And, um, and wait, 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 I'm confused. He's, he's now a Buddhist monk and he has a different name yeah uh, he wow. when when the company amicably broke up everybody was headed in different directions and the direction he wanted to pursue which is really what instigated the breakup was to devote himself more and more to his buddhist practice which wow. he's since done. yeah before wow. we get into the into the uh the uh soap opera of coming together and breaking up and so forth if we get that far <laughs> what um it's a question that we like to ask people in the beginning. Um, you know, what what goes through your with these three guys when you're doing this wonderful traveling and performing right before you, David, stepped out on stage? What would be going through your mind in terms of this epic adventure that you were in? You know, right. I'm talking like the 10 seconds before you would appear before the public. Well, I guess when I was working with Moving Picture Mime Show, it was a team sport. So the feeling, the thing that probably was in my head was to take that uh, energy that we all had backstage together and kind of go, let's go, you know, like heading out onto a basketball court, you know, Let, let's do this thing. So where, was there, were all of you athletes at one point? Where did that, that, that come from, that idea of a team sport? We no, I don't think we none of us, I think, were athletes, but because yeah. of the training at Lecoq's, we were all, you know, physical performance animals. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it's like you want to get out there and play, and the instrument you play is your body. So right, right. that's what it is. So so um did you guys uh, the three of you have like a, a like a group warm-up that you would do? You mean passing a joint around? <laughs> no, yeah, oh, I see. Yeah. You mean uh, uh, no? We didn't really have a group warm up. No, you you were all separately um, started and had rehearsed, and so you just knew who each other was, right? Yeah. yeah. So it seems there was a kind of an an attack, right? I, what I mean, what I mean by that is not with your samurai sword, but there's this kind of like you mentioned the animal energy and that kind of thing. It fe it feels like there was this excitement and kind of primal energy that you wanted to unleash for the public in a very therapeutic way for them and you in, in, in sorts right yeah exactly it was yeah. like we were gonna we were enthusiastic to assault the audience with an experience that they were gonna go what the hell that's kind of nice uh -huh. you know? uh -huh. Uh -huh. so that audience to you was just sort of just waiting to uh to have something thrown at them Yes, yes. Yeah. Maybe that was an illusion, but it, it certainly helps, you know. Uh -huh. What did most that? Audiences we found were in that state already. I'm not sure whether that's still the case with audiences today who are a bit more flipping through the phone and then going, "Okay, what's this?" Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't feel audiences are hungry anymore. You know, there, there was a kind of a hunger or a curiosity in the past. And, and were they, they were sure excited. That they were ready to to get something new. Yeah. yeah, they had come for that. So uh, how do you have that when you're working, touring solo, um, doing your solo work, how do you get, you don't have these partners to give you that energy. How do you get the energy to go on stage and, and how do you prepare to do your shows? Yeah, doing the solo show, I find... Uh, 
I mean, there is still the enthusiasm to go out there and play your body to to do this thing for the audience. But I find just before I go on these days, I remind myself to just tell the story. You know, that's what I've come to do. And it's not that complicated. You just go out there and talk to the audience and tell them the story you you came to bring them. You know, and and in my case, I tell them the story not just with words or not with words, but primarily with my body. Mm-hmm. And as opposed to like in our advancing years as performers, was there is there something else that has started to creep in that would get you sidetracked from this basic concept of telling the story? I mean, is there something, some hidden energy here that we should know about? Have you been talking? I know about- when I perform nowadays, after <laughs> years and years and decades and decades, my brain is so full of uh, all kinds of levels that you would never want a younger performer to even touch. You know, I'm just wondering how do you and I, someone like you and I and Karen filter out some of these other this other noise in a sense, or is that important? Do you think at this point in your career? Well, I guess it is true that we tend to <clears throat> attempt those voices that go, you know, this could go very badly wrong. And you know, you're aware, of course, that you're not really all that good. And uh, you no, know, you haven't really rehearsed this as much as you thought you were going to. And how about that ankle? You know, that ankle could go out at any moment now. Are you sure you want to do this? All those voices, yes. But you just, I guess maybe you, as a performer, you go, I understand, but that's not helpful now. Let's just go, oh, hey. Oh, the power did go out. Whoa. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That was ghostly. <laughs> oh, you're, get up your lights. Because lights are timed. Yeah. Oh, right. You just suddenly were very ghostly, right? At that moment when you were telling us about it. I thought we were going to be able to. rid of those thoughts and suddenly you're black and dark and spooky. <laughs> I thought we'd be able to set something cool up, you know, when that yeah. happened. But they, but you, um, so, so you, um, you can you can gotta say that's irrelevant. Let's just yeah. do it as if we were great. Yeah, you know? yeah. So what uh, what but what, what keeps you going though? Here's the question. You know, like we're getting into some well, other the areas. Fact money what, that I what, why why block those voices out for someone like yourself? Why why uh, you know you were telling you there are all these other voices of things that could happen that have accumulated up because of experience and longevity and so forth. What keeps you going? Like why would one like yourself and I and Karen, who are mature artists, let's say, why why do we keep performing? The what's what drives us? The pursuit of fun. Pursuit of fun. Ah. It's fun. It's a gas to do this. No, so you want to do this as long as you can. No, mm-hmm. is is the fun connected to like the like the actual risk that's involved in sort of um, being vulnerable and out there in front of the audience that kind of is is that fun for you like being putting yourself into this risky s- situation no not for me no uh, I what's prefer, the fun i prefer uh you know it's like when i used to play tennis and and i got pretty good around age 16 it's fun to play a great game of tennis mm-hmm. but the fun is associated with finding yourself going, bam, oh my God, I hit that shot just perfectly. And the challenge of, oh my God, can I get there and get that? Bam, oh, I just got, oh, I missed that one, but I'm going to get this one. So it's it's the fun of engaging in the game, you know? Mm-hmm. Of doing this is it more bad. fun being a soloist or being uh, in a group or there are two different animals in your- There are two different animals, but I think it's probably more fun being in a group. Yeah, yeah. And why so? Why do you think so? Because there's somebody to hit the ball back to you. Uh-huh. You know? And and I, yeah. How did you guys you were all students at Lecoq, I'm assuming, at one point, correct? Yes. How did, what 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 forces do you think brought you together besides the obvious, you know, situation you're in? But why why were the three of you attracted to each other and what kept you playing it and hitting the ball back and forth, so to speak? You know? I think uh, by the end of Lecoq's, after two years, we had a common language, uh, we had a common approach, and also we had kind of a common sense of humor, which was kind of uh, attached to the kind of uh, Chuck Jones, uh, Bugs Bunny cartoonish exaggeration thing. 
uh, each of us had done some work in pantomime blanche during that segment at Lecoq's, and, and it tended to be of similar style. Can you describe pantomime blanche? Yes, uh, pantomime blanche is a is is a language of direct communication with an audience, a visual language of direct communication with an audience, kind of exemplified by Pierrot in the in the classic uh, street um, uh, performance of the French whatever siècle. Uh, you see it in in the movie Les Enfants du Paradis, Children of Paradise, where mm -hmm. Where um, what's his name? That famous French guy, yes, who's played, de <laughs> who, who plays De Bureau, right? Uh, uh, does this scene where he he's leaning on the uh, uh, on the side of the uh, I don't know whatever banquette because uh, he's not in the scene and he happens to see a scene take place in the audience where uh, a lady. Uh, distracts a guy or somebody pickpockets something and then and then the guy says hey what the hell i've been i've been robbed i've been robbed and and the cops and come and arrest the wrong person i think the the damselle that is to come later the the pretty lady and and they're about to call her and she goes no no i'm innocent i'm innocent and they're going to haul her off and and she goes he saw it he saw it and the, everybody goes what what did you see and he whose character doesn't speak he goes well over there there was this guy with a mustache uh, and a big belly. And the audience goes, ah, ha, ha, ha. and over there, there's a little lady. And he describes, using gesture, I'm, I'm sitting down, but he's going, here's a little lady who's got skirts all around and, and she's all well, like this. And over there, he goes, oh, I'm going to sneak in here. And there's a sneaky guy who comes and reaches in. And this guy, uh, whoop, uh, whoop, uh, and uh, you know, so so he breaks down the story and and embodies each of the characters, describes and then uses each of the characters in order to tell a story involving multiple characters just with one person. And even to the point of the pointing, you know, like I noticed you yeah. did the gestures. That's all part of that that genre of performance. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and when you do your solo show, a little, a little business at the big top, you play all those different characters in a similar kind of a manner. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, was that the style of moving picture mime? Did you do a lot of that? Just to describe the kinds of shows that the three of you created together. Okay. Um, maybe this is the point to back up and tell a very long story. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. So uh, at the Lecoq School, the structure is in the first year, you learn all of the general principles of performance. That is for anybody, for teachers, for philosophers, everybody can be interested in, it's like learning the physics of how performance works. The second year is only for performers. And in the second year, you get dragged through various um, touchstones, stylistic touchstones of theater through history, Greek tragedy, melodrama. You go, how does Greek tragedy work? How does melodrama work? How does mask work work you know and how does clown work and one of the styles is pantomime blanche how does pantomime blanche work but that is how do you use nonverbal communication directly talking to an audience in order to convey a story and so in that process first you start off learning some i guess there's some technical exercises and then you start to get provoked by improvs like tomorrow come in and bring us bring us a story from the morning paper so each student comes in and goes, a, a bus driver uh, ran into a lady, lady with a pram crossing the street. Bus driver goes, oh, no, tries to stop, smash, runs into the lady and the baby uh, gets taken away to the hospital or whatever the story was, you know, murder, you know, somebody breaks into a house. So so you get little tiny chunks, a beginner version of telling a story in pantomime blanche, right? And the final, the biggest uh, improv is tell us your favorite movie, which is a big, you know, a movie's a big thing. So various people did various movies. And when I got up, I tried to do The Seven Samurai, which was a favorite movie of mine. And um, I, at a certain point, 
there were so many variables, you know, you've got first you got to establish the peasants, the peasants are working peasants, then you got to have the bad guys and they come in and they're bandits and they steal from the peasants. And now you got to have the peasants are unhappy and one guy has an idea, let's go get some samurai. So you got to have and you got to establish each of the samurai. So then you get the that you got to bring the samurai back to the village and establish we're going to build fortifications. And then you got to have now we're going to have training, tra how you train the various uh, and then the bad guys have got to come back and you got to have a fight scene and it's got to be big and all that and it was so many variables to deal with but and this was the first or second time that the muse has interceded in my life around the middle of this or maybe one third in the job the challenge of doing it all was so great that i completely lost track of the fact that it was impossible to do and managed somehow to get through to the very end of the movie. And at the end of the movie, it really felt like I had done the whole movie. And I turned around and looked at the audience of my student peers and they were all agog. They were all, wow, that was amazing. And Lecoq said, you know, you should work on that because school's gonna be over soon and you might be able to use that. So, okay. <laughs> How did you feel as an American going, you know, like so many of us on this side of the pond, as they say, have gone to Europe to study a lot. A lot of people, have, you know, who are successful and studied at Lecoq. How did you feel, uh, you know, from our American culture, East Coast, West Coast, right? They're different, but we're still Americans with all our influences. Movies were a big part of influences, uh, you know, in animation. I'm sure in your generation, well, we're the same generation, but animation had a profound effect on me. The classic Disney films of the yeah. 50s and the, you know, really uh, inspired me as a kid. But how did you feel bringing your culture or how, inserting yourself in this French kind of international place of of uh, learning? And you talked about the muse, you know, what, what muses presented themselves that you may not have discovered here in the USA? It's a big question, but. Well, first of all, at the time and probably ever since, uh, I was waltzing around the world uh, as a privileged middle-class American white guy. So I had no compunction at all about dragging my ass into uh, the French culture and trampling around in it and picking what I like from it. But, um, e the the you know there was so much to be learned that that even i ignorant as i was realized the beauty that was available to me i mean just from a whole different way of thinking of things you know like the difference between the way the french think about food and the way the americans think about food <laughs> you tell a french person that yeah i get a half an hour for lunch and they go are you nuts you need two hours to eat lunch. That's an insult. Why would you insult food like that? So the whole attitude was very different, and and I loved it. Yeah. So in a sense, it it might have slowed you down, and it may and it helped you to see the world how you wouldn't have seen it before, since you were moving so quickly in a in a sense through it. Yeah. You know, as in a fact, young artist. Yeah. 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 When I came to Lecoq's, I thought I was going to stay there for maybe a week or two, learn everything there was to learn there, and then move on to Czechoslovakia and learn everything they had there, and then over to Japan and learn that for two weeks and pick up everything in the world, and then I'd be able to, you know, know everything. And Lecoq went, excuse me, if you want to learn something, you need to stay. Mm -hmm. And that was entirely... I. I'd never considered that idea. You scolded, in a sense, by Lecoq. Was, right? yes, yes, in a yeah. sense. But yeah. fortunately, by the time we had that conversation, I'd been in class for a couple of weeks, and I'd recognized that, damn, there is a lot to be gotten here. So mm -hmm. I'm going to stay. Yeah. So, so when you left the school and the three of you hooked up to make this company, mm -hmm. how did that evolve? And Because uh, it was for 10 years, right? Yeah. And how did you, how did you, the three of you create shows and that, the so, creative aspect of it? So after school, I went back to America and they went back to England. And then at some point they emailed, or no, they wouldn't have emailed, would they? They called <laughs> or sent me a letter and said, listen, uh, we're making some masks and we've got a gig 
to open to to do a show at a theater for two weeks. Come on over and let's do the samurai show, which we had worked up as a three person thing before we left school and done it on the streets. So let's they were working together. They after they left school, the two of them were working together. Yeah, they both lived in London after that and and got together and made some masks. And those those formed the second half of the first show we did. The first show we did was The Seven Samurai and a three mask pieces, which were nice too. Two of them involving Kaki and Dodo, a classic sort of Laurel uh, uh, idiot and, uh, and angry guy mm -hmm. pairing, you know? And the other one was called The Examination, which was a very nice three-person thing um, 20 minutes long, a mask piece and, and masks, we're talking about larval masks here, masks of, of Baal, which are like this, right? Mm -hmm. So these are big head masks that allow you to do really, um, separated out and focused movements. Like when, when this guy, say this guy walks in and then he sees something, you can really get stuff out of each small saran wrapped gesture, you know, so mm -hmm. that it really focuses the audience's attention on detail. And so this exam piece was um, three kids taking an, an exam at, a, at an English public school. And mm -hmm. the first you saw the professor come in and then the, the smarmy teacher's pet person comes in and helps lay out the papers and then uh, goes out and the first kid comes in and the first kid is a little snurdy little, um, you know, crawly kind of nerdy uh, uh, kid uh, who who doesn't, re uh, sneak, sneak kind of kid. And the second kid is a very high, very uh, uh, proper English boy who, who seems to, have, you know, he always does the homework and it's every very punctilious with everything. And, and, and uh, and the third one is a complete brick. He's a complete, <laughs> you know, thick guy, like a doorknob face, right? <laughs> and then and, and then the the they start doing their papers, and the the guy who does really good paper, he's he's immediately he's going to uh, answers that, answers that, answers that, answers that. Answers that answers he's clearly knocking these things out and the and the kid so that so that the audience becomes uh bored with watching him because they go oh, okay i get the deal with him so they drift over to the left and they see the little snivelly kid who's gone okay i'm gonna i'm gonna do this i would uh, uh oh uh, that's right and uh uh oh uh and he's having trouble with one and so they see him having trouble with one and 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 the other guy's not. And so he looks over and he goes, oh, that guy's not having trouble. So you could, so the audience gets to watch him sort of go, well, I wonder if I could just um, catch a look over here at what, what is he doing? And, you know, and then the Toby, who's playing the the good student goes, oh. and and of course, with the timing of that, the little kid who's, uh, who's trying to sneak one goes, oh, I mean, I'm back. I'm not cheating at all. So anyway, the whole piece is this lovely examination of the drama of taking an exam. And mm -hmm. of course, for, I have um, a question about you, because you, you went to great lengths to, to um, kind of describe what was happening and, and the the exhibition of the mask. So we all, we know that mask work is a wonderful journey of uh, the understanding of clarity and economy and where energy goes. And I'm wondering, you know, how today's I'm kind of jumping ahead here, but how today's students relate to that kind of work? Because throughout you know our our careers, this sense of economy and essentiality and and uh, focus that mask work teaches you is very powerful. But somehow I'm, I get the hunch that younger generations, particularly younger kids who are interested in theater and maybe physical theater, that this is a very a more elusive. Uh, area that they're finding hard to maybe connect with or to even understand. How do you feel about that? You know, I mean, I think the font that, you know, the screens have made people very sedentary and very unobservant and very um, unclear about what it means to be alive in, in some ways, right? Different than yeah. when we grew up. So I'm just wondering what are your thoughts on that in terms of this 
this math technique that you're describing? And then how does that relate with the younger generations? Is there a problem or not or what? What do you think? So uh, I got to say, I don't get to teach mask to these students because this is a general university. This is not right. a, a dedicated studio. So I haven't taught mask, particularly larval mask to people for a long time. So I don't really know. I think it, it would be nice, but it has less direct um, implications for an actor trying to go out and work in the commercial marketplace of you know film and TV and realistic acting. So yeah, exactly. So I'm wondering, is it is it are these lost arts that you and I are and Karen are masters of? Is are these lost arts that they, they will be? <laughs> they have a yeah. I have to keep is, teaching, David. That's a whole other subject we can talk about a little later. Yeah. But I mean, uh, this is a, this is getting right to the heart of the problem here or the challenge. You know, there's a there's a phrase on your website that I wanted you to sort of elucidate. It says uh, in terms of your teaching of mass classes, uh, learning to play at the level of the mask. What do you mean by that? Yeah. OK, so. Um, so if an actor learns how to adapt their body to the way the mask wants it to move, then the audience will see a unified being. Mm -hmm. and the audience will go, oh, that's the mask, right? Mm -hmm. um, if an actor doesn't know how to do that, then the audience will see, oh, that's a, an actor wearing a mask. Yeah. And that's not, mm -hmm. that's not what we want. I think in the times when I've worked with masks and also neutral hood work, it will almost as if the students learn more from watching what people are doing, like what what they observe. And then when they get a turn to try it out, it, it it's it's pretty magical that people can catch on to it very quickly. What works and what doesn't when when the mask comes alive or or when the person is trying to force the mask to do something. Um, I, 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 I think that people actually uh, cotton on to the idea of it pretty quickly. It's pretty interesting. That is interesting. Yeah. And it's a good reminder to me that people, most of the learning is happening when people are watching someone else do it. Mm -hmm. Really, mm -hmm. when you get called on to, to go up and do it, you're really offering yourself up as guinea pig. It's not like you're going to learn it while you're doing it. You're mm -hmm. going to show them how not to do it. And they'll go, oh, I'm not going to do that mistake. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Just, just spending a little, little more time with the Moving Picture Mime Show. Do you have any disaster stories that might have happened to you guys when you were traveling around the world? Anything come to mind that was uh, <laughs> particularly challenging or uh, absurd that you would have experienced? <laughs> well, uh, let's see two of them that come to mind three of them come to mind and one of them I probably shouldn't say but the <laughs> other two uh, one time we were doing a show I don't know where it was uh, it was a raised stage right and and we were doing the mask work was it uh, I don't know whether it was I don't know what show it was whether it might have been handled with care but more likely was something like uh, the art gallery or the picnic or something or other and and uh, and I was off stage so they must have been on there engaging the audience and and I heard a crash and it turned out Toby because you can't you it's difficult to see in these things that you're yeah. trying to see through these little tiny things here because the eye of the mask is invariably not where your real like eye. performing in a submarine isn't it I mean, yeah it's not like, yeah yeah yeah, so apparently Toby had stepped off the stage and fallen three feet and crashed down. And I guess he got up and climbed up on the stage and continued the show. <laughs> As opposed to when we were doing, we we did a show, one of our last shows, uh, directed by Ken Campbell, uh, because the company was not very uh, ensemble-ish, so we, we needed somebody to referee us. Um, <laughs> it was called The Complete Burke which in English uh, means kind of the complete dork, you know? And uh, and it was remarkably absurd. At one point we came on with, uh, in, in odd costumes with Chinese urns 
and Toby would go over to Paul and pour his urn into Paul's dish or something, and peas, beans would pour out, and that would be, and we we would do everything as if it were immensely significant, you know, <laughs> sort of. I don't know what the hell it was there, and and uh, <laughs> and 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 then Toby would. Uh, take a, or Paul took one of the beans and put it into Toby's ear and then Toby would take his ear and drop it out onto the plate significantly <laughs> you know and and uh, in one of the shows I guess he put it too far in or it stayed in too long and Toby exited the stage and we're going ah that's not supposed to happen well, we'll just continue doing it. We'll skip to the next scene and find out, do something, do something. And now Paul leaves the stage and I will engage the audience doing whatever I was supposed to do. And then when I get off stage, I go, what the hell? Where's Toby? And he says, the ear, he got the pee stuck in his ear. They, they called the EMTs and he's at the hospital having it taken out. And we're oh in the my middle God. of the show. Oh my gosh. Are you guys still on speaking terms? I mean, do you still connect? Or is <laughs> yeah, life definitely. taking you in different directions entirely? We, we, it's it's uh, we we do connect, and we're still very good friends. We that's great. We root for uh, each other. The description of that piece that you just did uh, um, is very different from the earlier ones that you were talking about. The the three of you kind of evolved into different ty styles. Yeah. 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 Did you and feel you know, when the when the group disbanded? Did you feel that what what were what were your thoughts about your next steps after uh, Moving Picture Mind show, you know, dispersed? I thought I would then uh, go on to to have the brilliance of my fabulousness revealed now that these two dead weights have been removed <laughs> from my ankles. <laughs> you came no, back. I, to the, you came back to the United States. I I. Uh, I actually, after that, I I got called up by Lecoq. So I went back and taught at Lecoq's for two years before uh, I went to the States. Oh, so now that's a really interesting aspect of your career, too, because what, what is it like to be be a student and then to be asked by Mr. Lecoq to actually be his colleague to teach at the school? It was very, um, you know, it was a dream come true. Although I remembered being quite deferential as a student to him. And I when I went over to, to meet with him and talk about it, I was staying at Dodie's. Dodie DeSanto was then doing her third year. And uh, and I had dinner with her or something. And I shared with her, I said, you know, I'd like to do it, but I don't want to do it if I have to be the same relationship with Lecoq. You know, mm -hmm. in, in French, there's a difference between tu and vous. You know, you say you say to to your in, to your family, and vu is a term of respect. And I thought, you know, I got to call him too if this is going to work. And she said, you know, just do that then, and and accept and just do that. You know, dictate the terms. And I did, and I was happy with it. I mean, it, what it, was your uh, what was your area of of teaching with him? Was it the red nose clown or the mask work or movement or several different things? Mostly what he wanted me to do was uh, the larval mask stuff mm -hmm. uh, and pantomime blanche. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm feeling, I'm thinking, um, and we talked a little bit about it a few minutes ago, but the the technique of the larval mask or mask work in general is, is very elusive for mo modern generations of students. And it's, you know, I, I, I it's curious to me, you know, if one can really teach that or just kind of offer examples of students to like jump in the pond with, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, oh, well, the lights are on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you can teach it, but that is the way you teach it. You got to find first. You first you go through some technique, you know, and right. go articulation, and then you go look. What's a story that you guys can figure out to tell with these masks? And and the constraints are, they're not going to talk. They can't eat and they don't smoke. Well, that's most of human behavior right there, you know? So, so what things can these things do in front of an audience that you can turn into a story? And that's the challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah. if you can find a story to tell, 
then you as a teacher can go, okay, look, like uh, if you're doing this guy, uh, who's this? I, I haven't played this guy. I haven't played this guy in a long time. So let's say uh, you come on and you go, um, <laughs> okay, so that's say maybe an uh, English policeman sort of thing, but but maybe you could go further. Maybe you could be um, yeah. Ah, yeah. Uh, it I becomes mean, um, it's much more physical in the outline. The shape of the body changed so much. Yeah, what's uh, and it made the, the character uh, a little bit more exaggerated, but still very believable. Yeah, here's yeah. a question. Here's a question. So, you know, I believe a mime is a clown is a mime is a clown, for example. And, uh, and I feel that one of the challenges of younger generations of people interested in clowning is the dance of the clown is missing. For example, in the work you just did with the math, there is a dance of the math, meaning, you know, economy and clarity and all this, you know, essentiality and all these kind of things. So I feel the same thing is true in mask work. And as we know, the red nose is what called the smallest mask in the world, right? So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on the connection between the larval mask, for example, and red nose work. Is there or not? Because I think there's some physical and emotional connections in both work that's very hard to translate to younger generations today in terms of the red nose work. Uh -huh. um, what are your feelings on that? You know, because I know the red nose work was a very important part of Lecoq training that's at points, right? So, yeah, although it is an extension of the mask work, as you right, mentioned, right. Uh, uh, the two share the fact that you have to find the body that conforms to the mask, whether it's yes, this yeah. mask or this mask, and that body has to be different than your normal body, right? Right. Mm -hmm. even, you know, I, I was thinking just now, uh, even if you're just doing stand-up, and I don't mean to denigrate stand-up, but I remember, um, who was that guy? A young comic who's really good said, when I step out on stage, I got to have more energy than normal because the audience doesn't come to see just a guy. You got to be a show, you know? So even a stand-up comedian has to bring the body of the performer out on stage, right. not just their body. So mm -hmm. in that sense, the, the clown work is the same, the trying to find what is, who is, first of all, who is this guy, this guy that I see when I put on the red nose, and how does that guy behave? What is their body? How does their body move? You know, are they are they pinched at the top? Are they broad at the top? Are they and and do they are they curious? Are they reticent? You know, all those things, same as you do with a mask. Is this guy you want to discuss? Is he is he curious? He seems to be curious because anyway, you know, you'd ask all those questions, and more importantly, with a with a, a colleague you would try those out and go look mm -hmm. let me I'm gonna try I'm going to try I'm going to be this I'm 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 I well, I don't know what I just did there I'm I'm enthusiastically mobile how's that work and your yeah. your buddy goes yeah okay so we're trying we're finding a mysterious channel for how to discover inner life you know both mask work and red nose work they you discover inner life meaning that you are who you are and what those that that blood running through your system is, you know, so you're because you're talking about that right now. But I think both those areas, you would probably agree, like a, a, approach this discovery of what the inner life, what who is this person, and what what is the channel for them to express themselves. Yeah, but importantly right. for the Lecoq process, importantly it is through, um, you know, an awareness and the capacity to manage your outer self that you can be completely that person. Like you, if you are a certain type of person, how does that person walk? And it's your whole body has to accommodate to that rather than kind of being a talking head actor. So so in Lecoq, is it uh, uh, pretty much like the out, outward in, like the outward shape of things and the w gestures and the movement? Um, start and then you get to feel the in, inner life of that character? Does it go that direction? Yes, it tends to go that direction, although it is it is aware. I think it does that because of the enormous balance in the other direction. Here's the deal. Here's the, here's the, uh, as Joe Biden would say, here's the deal. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I call the actor's equation. The interior attitude 
is equal to the exterior attitude. What is felt on the inside is what is expressed on the outside. Mm -hmm. Most American training goes, okay, I'm going to feel like I love Juliet and I'm going to trust that the body is going to express that, which if you're a good actor and your body is relaxed and available will be the case. But it's also true that you can use your body to help you get that feeling. You can go, if I put my arm up here and and wave like this, I can, by God, feel like liberty leading the people much more easily. I'm patriotic. And those who know me know that's not my usual thing. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to die for these principles, you know. And right. Then, high school principles we're talking about, but I'm ready to die for them. <laughs> So, so the idea is to remind an actor that the equation works in both directions. Mm -hmm. You can use the external to tell you about what the internal is and, and, and just be aware of that connection so that you can go, you know, you're pretending to be um, suspicious, but you're, you're, th your leg is not feeling what is what is the leg of a suspicion you're not that's not getting the message is not getting down to your lower train and then mm -hmm. the actor oh, yeah yeah what is the lower train of a of a suspicion okay so that you can be the thing with your whole body that's the whole mm -hmm. deal yeah. Karen, did i hear some music did i hear what? some music? did i hear some music uh distance magically oh. you did i did what is that what is that music jay ah uh, i know what it is Oh, it's a time for David to dance for us. Lovely. This is our gift music. Did you receive a gift from the My Museum? My Museum? Oh, my Museum. Aha. Uh -huh. Ooh. What? 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 Just a moment. Ooh. Ta-da. Oh. Yes, I did. But uh, it's upside down. So I'll have oh, to yes, so. That's no wait. Let me just. What could this be? Attention, do not open this until on air. All right, let's do this. Hmm. <laughs> you know, at the Mime Museum, we collect all these things from different mimes, and we it's just got you know too crowded, so we've been sort of sending things back. Oh, artifacts. Thank you for uh huh. On the Miami description, after a performance deemed best of fest at the Orlando Fringe Festival, I know this guy. <laughs> this mime samurai sword was found backstage. Since David Gaines refused to pay the shipping costs, the sword was donated to the Mime Museum. However, the sword is too dangerous to display, and it is finally being returned to Mr. Gaines. Wow. This sword is lethal. Unfold carefully. Dang. Well, let me just go. Oh. Whoa. So it is. Wow. That's amazing. Uh, so, so maybe you could draw that sword and just sort of show us some moves with it. You know, your your samurai moves. Just well, just slide it out of the slide it out of the scabbard. You see oh, it? I see. This sword is already drawn though, and and drawn so well that I. <laughs> ah, what's it? You know, the most important thing about the uh, samurai sword is not so much the movement, but the sound effects that sell the oh. story. You know. Oh yeah. yes, so can can you demonstrate a little bit for us? Oh, that's right. Yeah. Wow. So I love that show. I I could. No, I should, shall I do that show for you? No. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so your your solo version is back from you did it as a solo, and then you did it with the three of you, and now it's back to seven times one samurai. Yeah, it's actually I think of it as seven by one samurai, like two by four. You know that X two oh, X four. Oh, right. Okay. Seven by one because it's seven samurai done by one guy. Right. Ah. And, uh, yeah, so at a certain point, I was teaching a workshop up at uh, a Celebration Barn, and uh, we were having lunch, and I was sitting next to a guy, uh, David Nez, and we were talking, and he was saying, so what do you got in mind? And I said, well, you know, I've been thinking maybe I could try and do uh, it's a Seven Samurai just as a one-person show, you know, but I was thinking I'd, I'd need to, you know, maybe have a mask for the samurais and a mask for the bad guys, and then that way I could separate the, I'm thinking structurally to try and, I'm still, you know, spinning the idea. 
And he goes, well, you know what? I'm, I'm, I went to a, a workshop to do ba- masks and, and I'm, I'm a mask maker. And I went, oh, well, let me see your stuff. And I looked online and I thought, mm, this guy's got talent. So, so, and, and I liked the guy. We, we were simpatico. So we collaborated. And as I was building the show, the one person show, he was building these masks and he came up with these great masks. Here's the mask he came up with for the head of the samurais. Oh, wow. And, and, uh, and then this is the, the head of the bad guys, which is much more Kabuki inspired kind of thing. You know, this is more inspired by those uh, woodblock paints of samurais, you know, that you get the mm-hmm. Japanese. Ones. And but, they're, and they're half masks. So you can speak with them like in Commedia dell'arte. Exactly. Yeah. Cause I needed to speak to, to do the sound effects. Uh-huh. And, uh, and I like half masks anyway. But, but the you, previous the previous version of of that piece when you did it with the other two partners it wasn't a mask piece it was not oh because you know to do a one man thing you need to help the audience a little more when we would do it as three one person would step out and i'm a peasant and now one guy comes down and goes i'm the bad guy and then the other character goes and i'm a samurai and i'm going to call you to account you know so so the audience could keep track of them all more easily but how does one uh, in today's world you know it's which is very complex with gender and cultural identity and uh cancel culture and all these crazy things that are happening out there in the world. How do, how do you keep like the show, like the samurai, which is obviously has some ethnic, ethnic, you know, characters in it, like Asian characters. How do you um, work with that material and still feel that you're um, not treading on someone's toes unnecessarily given the political, social climate of today's world, you know? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I do. I do. I've, I've had some people express concerns and I've had workshop, you know, round table discussions about it. Uh, my take on it is I am making fun of these people as people and it doesn't matter what ethnicity they are. We are all ridiculous people. Is so, that enough? Is that enough to convince those that are, are, I don't want to say militant, but those that are very, have strong feelings about these, these, current issues is that i'm not sure it always get through that or i mean what are some of the challenges here you know so uh well some of the challenges for a performer i guess one of when i was doing the show up in seattle uh the theater owner told me that he had received complaints from someone about the show uh and and they were complaining simply on the basis of the image on the poster uh, so my attitude they, is well, come see the show, you know, and then yeah, complain. Right. Yeah, they yeah. hadn't seen the show even yet. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Complainers going to complain is my theory. And so some people, these are invariably white people, white middle-class people who are complaining on behalf of the aggrieved group. Uh-huh. For instance, I was doing it down in um, South Carolina somewhere and, and a group of students who were aggrieved uh, had issues with it. And, there was a Japanese professor there on on loan or on sabbatical or something, and he went. I thought it's funny. I I got yeah, no yeah, problem. Yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it one it's never a bad thing to be encouraged to consider whether you're hurting someone's feelings unnecessarily. Uh-huh. On the other hand, there is also the phenomenon of people who would like to pipe up about so would like to be outraged about something and it's more about their need to be outraged than it is really about the problem at hand sometimes so how should a like we're talking maybe your artistic philosophy as an artist like how does what does one how much does one respond to the public or the audience and how much does one uh follow their own you know, heart in, in a sense, you know, like we all made the decision at some point, well, we're going to either do commercials, you know, act in commercials, or we're going to make, you know, the seven samurai m- m- uh, show, you know, like we, we made, we had choices and mm-hmm. it's always, you know, it's that great big dilemma for young artists, you know, dramatic artists, what direction do we go? Right. So 
How do you, um, what's your philosophy on that? How, did, how, did, how does one, how do you navigate through this world of complainers and uh, people with issues and people with, you know, you know, arguments to, to promote? What, what do you, what, what, how do you keep going as an artist? I would say do what you can as much as you can. You know, uh -huh. if you, if you can't do something, then you can't do something, do something else. You know, if you get stopped uh, or, you know, if you get stopped from doing what you want to do because someone won't let you or because you need to make money to eat, that's fine. You know, life is bigger than your little wants. But yeah, as much it seems as like you're, yeah. it seems like you're, uh, you're the, the sense of joy and like you used the word fun earlier in our, our conversation. It mm -hmm. seems like that's an important element for you personally. You know, it's, you know, find the, the joy and keep and keep doing it as long as you can, right? Yeah, that's yeah. the whole of it for me. Yeah, I should yeah, point yeah. out, that, uh, apropos of our previous conversation, there was one lady, the little business of the Big Top Show. Uh, it's a it's basically a Popeye cartoon at the circus, but in it I also play a little dog that be befriends the guy and uh, and and a uh, an ape. Uh, at the circus, as well as what else is there? Anyway, that I play this ape who I think is kind of a chimpanzee-ish, but he's kind of the size of an orangutan. So I'm not sure. I'm kind of melding things together. But anyway, he's he's the the monkey basically, and and he lives in a cage, um, and he's abused by the ringmaster, who's an abusive, alcoholic, brutal guy. You know, and the more he drinks, the more brutal he gets, and he pokes him with a stick, and we don't like that guy, and we feel sorry for the the monkey. You know. In the end, the monkey gets his comeuppance on the ringmaster, of course, uh, and and by letting himself out of the cage and going to save the day, help save the day. In any case, I got some feedback from a lady who 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 was pissed off that there was animal cruelty in the show. Hmm. <laughs> so, a the animal's not real. I don't, you know, I appreciate the respect for my craft, but. That animal wasn't that's there's no real animal there. That was just me, you know, and also B, he got himself out of his cage. He's smarter than the ringmaster. Anyway, so people have button issues. Uh, yeah. With that boot. So so, David, when I don't know, are you working on new material or to go back to when you were creating these pieces what what's the start? What's the inspiration for creating a piece? How how do you get started? Uh, you take a hot bath. <laughs> yeah, you you try and put yourself in a situation where you're relaxed and your mind can wander, and then images come to you. You know, and if it's strong enough, you, you go. I, I want to see. How, maybe I can make that happen. Mm -hmm. Case in point. The origin of Little Business at the Big Top was I was in the bathtub or the shower or something, and I was remembering the song, the Bruce Springsteen song. Um, is it Born to Run? It starts off, the screen door slams, Mary's dress waves, like a vision she dances while the radio plays. And then, uh, how's it going? Thunder Road. I think it's called Thunder Road. Anyway, but it's it's this great song that is epic in the story it tells about this guy, you know, presumably a biker in New Jersey, you know, saying to this girl, come on, let's go ride, you know, let's leave this town, even though your parents don't want you to, the girl's probably underage or something, you know, that kind of thing. But but it had such a great idea. I thought this would be a perfect clown piece, you know? <laughs> The, the the beautiful girl is a clown beautiful girl and she comes out the back door and then clown boyfriend comes on his Harley, you know, and she jumps on the Harley and clown girl's dad comes out the back door with a shotgun and actually shoots at them and they get chased up the 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 uh, ladder across the high wire, you know, chased in a very clownish way. I thought that'd be great, you know. I couldn't make that happen, actually. But the the upshot was Little Biz is the Big Top, where we do get to have a chase across the high wire, um, death-defying, knife blade, cutthroat thing. <laughs> yeah. So you, you where you end up is not where you head off for. That's always mm -hmm. the case. Yeah. And then so, at the end of the piece, you're like, 
you're starting on a new piece and you're like, wait, how did I do it last time? I can't remember. How did this, how did that piece, I love doing that piece. It turned out so great, but where did it come from? And then you yeah. have to sort of go back to the hot bath, I guess. <laughs> and the hard part is is making yourself believe that it's it's possible. Yeah. 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 I, I feel James is kind of, Are you getting hot? Oh you no. feel that, David? Ah. I, do, I feel that. This is the smoke. Turn it's that time again. It's time oh, for no. rapid fire. Oh, oh my no. god. Oh, 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 fire out. Fire. Oh. Okay. <laughs> it's time for rapid fire, David. Okay. Uh, Yes. This is, uh, if you've watched some of these interviews, there's a period in the interview where I'm going to throw some terms at you and you're going to react with your crazy brain in the moment. Yeah. It's yeah. a word association game. Okay. All right. And uh, we're just going to play it a little bit. Um, it's a it's str uh, strategic uh, game that we throw in here when things are getting a little boring. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> You can you can get up and move around if you like, or you can just stay in your chair. It yeah. So, uh -huh. he's going to be brave. verbally, physically, or uh, however you want to. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you game to play? I am game. I'm. Yes. All right. Let's do this. So clear your mind, and um, we'll start. Whatever yeah. comes to your mind, give us a, an expressive answer. Okay. Hands. Hands. Hmm. Um, uh, undulations. Hmm. Nice. Um, top hat. Uh, monopoly. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't have to be verbal. It can be just physical. Yeah. Uh -huh. Behind the corner. Behind the corner. Around, Around the corner. Around the corner. That is a great, um, you know, at Lecoq's, we would have, at the end of at the end of the term, Lecoq would give each student a command, a a commission, sort of, right? Uh -huh. And you would have to construct your final project on that. And the terms would be like, you know, behind the green door and less than you bargain for. And that phrase strikes me as precisely one of the things that Lecoq would say around the corner. Okay, okay. let's see it around let's the corner, David. Around the corner. Oh, okay. Wow. Well, well this is. See, I'm. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, 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 um, okay. Um. Ah, yeah, good. Great. That's good. Spotlight. <laughs> Spotlight. Spotlight. Yeah. Um, James Brown. <laughs> um. Uh, age. Age. Hmm. Well, that reminds me of the Marceau thing uh, that I always loved and could never do. Uh, mm -hmm. Four things of uh, youth, maturity, maturity old age, old age and, and death. And, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and, he, and he did it. He was just standing there and he would just go from foot to foot and his body would evolve and then return to zero. Child. Uh, delightful. Very great. Mm -hmm. And yellow Ferris wheel. Yellow Ferris wheel. Uh, Give us a reaction. Some reaction. Um, <laughs> expansive view, I guess. Ah, All right, great. So the Ferris and wheel, I people are divided into two camps. You're either the person that likes a Ferris wheel or you're the person that likes the roller coaster. And I, oh. I like the Ferris wheel, but the Ferris wheel just goes around and around in the same cycle, whereas the roller coaster is a terrifying, uh, you know, it's it's frightening, mm. ups and downs. Yeah, I think I'm on a Ferris wheel um, person, too. What about you, James? Would you choose roller coaster or Ferris wheel? Neither one. Um, Neither? Okay, last word. Uh, <laughs> mime. Uh, <clears throat> burden. What? Burden. 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 Yeah. Wow. Great. That was rapid fire, ladies and gentlemen. Now I want to stop there because the, the question arises, where do we go from here? So we've had this, uh, these decades of uh, wonderful adventures, uh, 
you know, the mime, the clown, the physical theater, the mask, like David, what, what are your thoughts on where do we go from here? Is what we do still relevant and uh, blah, blah, blah. Like what, 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 what's around the corner? I think for physical uh, theater for physical theater for physical theater. I think uh, what we do is no longer relevant. The question is, wait, a minute, wait, explain that. Explain. You got to explain that. Yeah. Well, we're old. And so we're no longer relevant. Our cultural references, mine anyway, have been uh, irrelevant for 20 years now. Okay. Uh, however, the the effect that we may have had or may have will be demonstrated by the new kids coming up that are inspired by either the work we've done or the work we've pointed them to or or just their own idea of what physical theater might be. You know, this thing ebbs and flows. Yeah. Where the, we had a mime uh, surfeit in the 70s after Marceau, and then it kind of uh, went down a bit or it changed into more physical comedy and then there's moving picture and complicite and all that and uh, it kind of is in a low point now and presumably it will resurface when when the culture as a whole gets sated with uh, verbal theater is it uh is it yeah you're right everything goes in cycles is it is it silly to use the terms mime or clown in today's world with younger generations or is there a new way to approach all this I don't think it's silly. I think you're going to, you, you have to accept that you will not be what you mean may not be what is understood because the culture at large has already told them what mimes and clowns are about. And that's not what we think of mimes and clowns is about. So uh -huh. it's only on a more intimate level that you'll be able to convey what you mean when you say clown or mime. Uh -huh. So in a <laughs> sense, do you feel you're a missionary or that you have a, uh, a, uh, a calling to continue, um, you know, spreading the the gospel of physical theater, so to speak. I mean, are you? I is don't. It that, is it that important to you, or I mean, or do you do you let the chips fall where they may? I'm going to let the chips fall where they may. That's uh -huh. yeah, in yeah. keeping with my general principle of being irresponsible for as much of the world as possible for as long as possible. <laughs> but in your in your teaching at the university, do you get a chance to sort of sh share your your sort of joy of of creation and physical theater and and the physical side of acting? Yeah, and that's where the that's the great part of it. That uh, every now and then there is a student or a few students who go, "Oh my God, I'm so excited about this and the possibilities and the concepts and all that." So thank you. So. You know, that student is going to go on, whether they work in the theater or not, but they're going to go on to to uh, to develop and have that enthusiasm for that aspect of the work that I think of as as so beautiful. They will. Yeah. They will think of it as beautiful, and too. Well, that was actually true when we were coming up, too, because just like we're a small minority of the performers who just latched onto this idea of of the physical expression and 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 how can that be expanded and explored and you know it we it was some sort of quirk of our own imagination that that's the thing that we liked most about acting is is is, is teaching and performing are they do they go hand in hand in terms of you know you, we say we're a, a physical theater artist or a mime or a clown is is teaching part of that world naturally do you feel i mean in, in terms of i mean a performance is a kind of classroom also if you talk to someone like jeff hoyle who doesn't teach you know jeff hoyle right uh, i know him by name and he used yeah to but he will say my performance is my classroom you know he, he doesn't like to teach a class right so mm -hmm. i'm just wondering how you feel is 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 it natural that a, that an a performer will teach and vice versa. And is it important for that to be embraced going forward? What do you think? I think it is natural. Certainly there are out there people who, who aren't good teachers or who don't like to teach. I think those right. two are probably related. Um, but I think it's natural that teaching is part of the ecosystem of a performer, particularly over the whole life cycle, because in the beginning, you need to to teach in order to make money, even though you know, don't know what the hell you're talking about. And then 
you don't need to teach so much when your performance career takes off. And then once your body starts breaking down, you need to teach again in order to be able to do those performances in the classroom. And because it's nice, it's only suiting, it's only fitting that you give back to those that might have an ear to hear. Right. How, how do you um, how do you account for the aging process? How, what kind of adaptations do you do, or what? How do you approach the the that concept of the aging performer artist? I, performing I, artist? I use the application of hope. I hope <laughs> my knee will not go out when I have to do a performance. That's... Yeah, maybe, but do you, you know, like if you watch a like a like a master musician, let's say, like a classical musician. Mm -hmm. You know, um, everything they do is very economical, like, you know, from walking on the stage to preparing the instrument to playing, there's less pyrotechnics with an older artist. Right. I think that's true with a physical theater artist also. I'm just wondering. Do you feel you that trust, too? If you trust, uh, um, trust that it's in your body by now mm -hmm. and what you don't need is not going to show up and you won't, maybe you don't need it. And what is essentially there will still be there. What do you think about that? That's a good thing? question. And it's a big question. I yeah. guess the answer first. Uh, yeah. I tend to trust that it's in my body and, and what is most important will come out. Although I should say uh, recently, well, recently it was probably 10 years ago. I was doing the Seven Samurai. I did it in Chicago, actually. And my friend, Tom Simpson, who I've known since college, I shared with him, you know, I go, I was doing it the other night and I was thinking, yeah, I'm hitting all the karate poses, but I'm not hitting them with the lightness, the deftness of touch that I that I want, that I intend, you know? And I recognize that that's because I just haven't got that deftness anymore. Uh, or I think I was talking about doing the diving roles, diving across the stage and doing a role and coming up, you know, I didn't. Yeah. And he said, well, OK, but bear in mind, uh, whatever the name of that famous Italian Harlequin was, he was still doing uh, Servant of Two Masters at 83 and dive, doing, you know, tumbling right. roles. And, and people weren't when he would do his his uh, forward role, people would applaud not because it's a forward role, but because he's freaking 83 years old and he can get through it at all, you know? So <laughs> I guess the spectacle changes focus. But on the other hand, I got to say, uh, the last time I saw Marcel Marceau with his company, I was going, Mark, may want to, you know, maybe time to hang it up, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how, does one, how does one know? How does the, the older artist know that it's time to hang it up, do you think? And I guess that's a personal choice. And hey, what the hell? If people are still paying him to do the work, why should he yeah, say, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, if it's fun for him, great. What um what advice would you have to the young people that are that are interested in um pursuing a life as a physical theater artist? Uh I would say if it's fun for you, pursue the fun. Uh if you can you need to make sure you spend a penny less than you earn, no matter how much you earn, even if you're earning very little, you know, and if that lifestyle is okay with you, that is, you can find people to share their apartment or you got a girlfriend that makes a lot of money or whatever, whatever the lifestyle brings you, if you can continue doing the work happily and you're making audiences happy, keep doing it. Yeah. If you are having a good time and the audience is not, I think you're in the wrong business. Yeah. Do you have any, uh, David, do you have any regrets? Do you have any, there's anything you would have done differently uh, at all when you look back? I mean, and, and like, I mean, the second part of this is, do you have any feelings about legacy or whether people are going to look at the tombstone and say, oh, that was David Gaines who had fun? You know, what, what are your feelings on that, those areas? <laughs> I have, uh, I would like for, the things that I love, this, what I've learned from Lecoq and the beauty of physical theater, I'd love for that to continue on. But hey, we're all going to go up like a celluloid collar in six billion years anyway. So what the hell does it make? Nobody's going to remember me. Uh, you know, in 200 years, there'll just be nothing. So screw it. Let let the parade roll on. That's what I say. <laughs> but on the, uh, in the meantime... 
I hope that the Mime Radio podcast introduces you, David Gaines, to many, many people so they know all the wonderful work that you've done. Yeah, 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 yeah. Our well, conversation hope, has been so I hope I can bring a show to their to their town, you know, at some point before I kick the bucket. Yes, you should. Come Actually, back to Chicago. <laughs> I'd love to. To your point about doing less, I remember seeing Dario Fo do his uh, his version of uh, whatever his big show was. And he, at some point, he's some pope from the 15th century. And he's just walking around the stage singing like a pope humming to himself. And he's putting on a robe and he's putting the big rings on, you know, and he's doing just the least suggestions of mime and it totally works. So, you know, if you can make it work, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, I guess it comes back, like you say, the the sense of joy and um, fun that you can that you find in the work. That's that's what drives us, you know. That's, yeah. that's what keeps us going. Um, last question, David. Uh -huh. What do you want to be when you grow up? Dead. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, ladies and gentlemen, that was Bravo, David, David. <laughs> in the Mind Reader Show podcast. Season four. Thank you very much, David. And please, everyone, educate yourself about David Gaines. He's a wonderful artist who's been around for a long time and has so much to share. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank David. You. Yeah. Bye -bye.